is Mike Masha at Kedwalader. Thanks for tuning in to Fund Finance Friday Industry Conversations. It's been a busy week, both inside and outside of Fund Finance, with the FFA's market update webinar this week, which uh, Nick Mitra and Terry Hatton did a great job organizing, and over 800 people uh, attended, which was terrific. Uh, on the macro, you know, tons to keep up with, with Jerome Powell's speech yesterday on monetary policy, the Republican National Convention, a hurricane, and more social justice uh, challenges this week. So, so lots going on for sure. Uh, we've decided this week to mix up industry conversations a little bit instead of focusing on market updates. Uh, instead, we've asked Jeff Nagel to join us to give a tutorial on the SOFA rate, which is the uh, replacement rate that will ultimately be taking over for LIBOR. Jeff, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Mike. You bet, you bet. So, you know, what I'd like you to do is kind of give a refresher on SOFA, as well as make sure people know the key bullet points that they, you know, will know to ultimately use SOFA in documentation for transactions. So maybe if you could start, uh, just give a little bit of a refresher on what SOFA is and why it's been selected as the replacement for LIBOR. Sure, sure. So as uh, hopefully everyone's aware, uh, the LIBOR cessation date is, is approaching closer and closer, uh, still looking like it's going to be the end of 2021. Uh, so financial market participants are looking more into what actually will be the replacement rate when LIBOR goes away. Uh, the rate that has been selected by the Alternate Reference Rates Committee is called SOFR. It's the secured overnight financing rate. Uh, the ARC uh, convened back in 2014. One of their primary goals was to look at whether or not LIBOR could be reformed or should be replaced with another rate. Uh, they held a beauty contest for two or three years, looked at a variety of different rates and where they settled for US dollar uh, LIBOR for replacement was called SOFR. Um, so SOFR, what SOFR does is it represents transactions in the treasury repo market. Um, it's administered by the New York Fed, uh, has been posted on the New York Fed's webpage since April of last year, although historical data goes back many, many years in order to construct a historical SOFR. Uh, the, the big thing to know about SOFR is that it is a robust rate, which is based on actual observable transactions. Uh, the primary problem with LIBOR is because there really isn't a lot of interbank lending anymore in the London market. Most of LIBOR was um, developed based upon banks' estimates of what they would uh, actually charge each other if they were actually lending to one another. So it was an expert judgment um, methodology in many cases, which had a lot of uh, serious shortcomings. Uh, SOFR is the exact opposite end of the spectrum, uh, whereas LIBOR maybe had about $500 million in daily transactions, SOFR has approximately $1 trillion per day. Uh, so it's a very robust rate based off of actual real life transactions. Uh, and that was one of the primary reasons why the ARC uh, chose to recommend SOFR as the replacement for LIBOR. So Jeff, what are the key practical differences between SOFR and LIBOR? So, so there's a number of differences between LIBOR and SOFR. I'll hit on the couple that are most uh, pertinent for the loan market. Um, the first one I stop at is that SOFR is an overnight rate, at least today. Uh, it is pulling um, rates based upon the treasury markets on a daily basis and updating on a daily basis. LIBOR is a term rate. Um, you all know that LIBOR is generally quoted uh, for a tenor, um, one month, three month, six month tenor. SOFR doesn't have that term component. It updates on a daily basis, which is significantly different than the way that rates normally work in, in loans today. And so base rate reference rate concept. That, that's right, that's right. So it will be updated on a daily basis, but a little bit later, maybe we can talk about some of the ways that the market is trying to evolve SOFR in order to make it more similar to the way the mechanics of, of LIBOR work. 
Um, one of the other uh, issues or differences between SOFR and LIBOR is that um, LIBOR is an unsecured rate, uh, SOFR is a secured rate. Uh, so that means that the two rates are going to behave differently. Not only are they different numbers, uh, in different scenarios, they're going to behave differently. Uh, and that's the um, uh, third point I'll hit on here is that LIBOR was meant to be a bank cost of funds rate. So uh, it's meant to um, uh, simulate how much a bank is actually paying for its funds. Uh, SOFR is a risk-free rate, so there is no bank credit component. Uh, as a result, the rate not only is, is likely to be lower than LIBOR, uh, as I mentioned, it's likely to behave differently. In times of stress, for example, in the markets, when, uh, when things are going poorly, LIBOR could be expected to blow out a little bit because there's more risk in lending from one bank to another. Conversely, SOFR is probably going to do the opposite and contract because there'll be a flight to safety and SOFR is based on treasuries that, or sorry, repos that are secured by U.S. treasuries. So there's a different um, there's a different way that the rates will react in different market environments. And so presumably to maintain kind of a comparable return profile, banks are going to need to adjust their margins on SOFR as compared to LIBOR too. I would expect. Yeah, so there's gonna there's gonna be two things that that will happen. Uh, one is that if you are transferring, if you are changing from LIBOR to SOFR, there's going to be something called a spread adjustment that will be added. That's to make the rates more comparable. Um, in addition, going forward, if you are just writing loans off of SOFR, so there's no spread adjustment, uh, the margins are likely going to be different. Um, the the concern for some banks in the market is that while you can adjust your margins at least day one. Um, as different market conditions develop, SOFR and LIBOR may react differently, uh, which would result in a different uh, economic return to banks and, and other uh, financing providers under certain circumstances. So Jeff, you had mentioned different variants of SOFR. Can you, can you give us some color on that? Uh, Sure. So LIBOR itself is, is a pretty simple uh, construct. Um, you, before the beginning of your interest period, you look, you see what interest period you're looking to use, uh, pull a number off of a screen, and that gives you the rate for the entire period. Uh, the, the conventions are pretty well known. You, most, uh, most market participants will look to see what LIBOR was at 11 a.m., London time to London business days before the start of the period. Um, SOFR itself is, is quite complex and a number of different conventions and methodologies around using SOFR are growing up in order to utilize it in a variety of different markets. Um, because of that, there are a number of different flavors or variants of SOFR that, that may make their way into, their mar into the market. And depending upon which flavor you use, uh, that could have a very uh, large impact both on your legal documentation and on the, the underlying rate that you use. Um, so maybe, maybe I'll start with the, the first one, which is probably the easiest to understand, which is term SOFR. Um, this is, is going to look and feel and smell a lot like your traditional LIBOR. Uh, the, there will be different tenors, you know, either one month or three month, maybe 30 days, maybe 90 days. But the concept of there being a tenor that you pick will be embedded within term SOFR. It will be forward looking. Uh, it will include a term premium um, and it can be selected much the same way LIBOR uh, would be selected today. So sounds great. Uh, something that can plug and play right for LIBOR into your documents. Uh, one big problem, there isn't a term so far today, uh, and we don't know if it will be here by the time LIBOR ceases. Uh, as part of the ARC's 2020 goals, uh, they were to select a uh, potential administrator for term so far um, by uh, some point this year. They're hoping that by the first half of 2021, a term so far can be published. Uh, but it really depends upon the underlying derivatives markets if there's enough uh, volume for the regulators to agree that a term SOFR can be uh, robust. 
um, hopefully we'll get there, uh, would make everyone's life uh, a lot easier in the loan market, but not quite sure if we'll get there in time. So you have to, you have to contingency plan for, for other uh, potential varieties of SOFR. You know, Jeff, over the last couple of years, we've seen some trends in the market away from term LIBOR tranches to a daily LIBOR mechanic. Um, maybe there will be some receptivity in the market towards an overnight rate. Yeah. So, so that's a, that's a good point, Mike. And the, the, the second variety of SOFA is also fairly easy to understand. Um, it's commonly called daily simple SOFA. Um, so this is just simply taking the SOFR that appears on the Fed's webpage and using that, multiplying that by the principal outstanding on a day, uh, that gives you the interest rate for that day. Uh, very much like a, like a prime rate or a base rate or a treasury's rate or a Fed's funds rates that, that folks may be using today. Uh, so that's very fairly easy to administer and operationalize. It also has fairly low basis to ISDA SOFR. Um, and for that, for that very reason, daily simple SOFR, um, pursuant to the ARC's refreshed hardwires, has been um, selected by the Business Loans Working Group as the preferred second step on the hardwired waterfall, meaning basically market participants are considering this to be maybe not as good as term SOFR, but a, but a close second for utilization for loan products. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, variants that people should be aware of? Sure. Um, another variant is called uh, compounded in advance SOFR. Um, this is one where uh, the Fed has been publishing for some time a compounded rate over a historical 30, 90, or 180 day period. Um, it's fairly easy, easy to operationalize because it is pulling a rate that the Fed produces off of their web page and plugging it in. Uh, the concern with compounded advance is the rate is stale. Uh, so for example, if you are borrowing for the month of April, uh, perhaps two business days before the beginning of April, you would look on the Fed's website, see what the rate is for a compounded in advance SOFR, a SOFR average. Uh, but what that SOFR average is doing is taking the SOFRs for every day during the prior month, during the month of March. So it's using March's rate to construct a rate for April. Um, in some products, this, this will probably work and will probably be quite useful. Uh, for, for example, in the floating rates um, uh, mortgage market, they'll use this rate. Um, it's something that you're able to tell a customer prior to the beginning of its, their interest period what their rate is going to be. Uh, it's easy to pull off a website. Uh, over the course of, a, you know, say, a 30-year mortgage, if your rates are off by a month at the beginning and the end, it really doesn't matter. There's not much of, of principle moving around. So the fact that you're using a slightly stale rate really doesn't matter much at the end of the day. Um, other other um, uh, loan products that may use this um, include receivables discounting, uh, where you need to have a rate that you know at the beginning of a period. Uh, using an in arrears rate is not going to work for receivables discounting. So compound in advance may be something that people go to. Uh, in the general loan market, um, we're not getting the sense that many folks are going to be using compounded in advance uh, because the rate's stale uh, and because that, that staleness presents some challenges. Um, and maybe the, the last one I'll touch on here is, is, is one of the most complex and um, uh, is called compounded in arrears. Uh, so what this is doing is getting to the end of your interest period uh, using an in arrears concept to look back to see what SOFR actually was during the period and then compounding on every business day uh, during that period. Uh, this is technically the most economically correct rate. It's actually using the daily SOFR. It's taking account of time value of money because of the compounding. Uh, this is what ISDA is going to use for their standard swap methodology. 
Um, the problem for the loan market are, are twofold. Um, one, it's very complex to administer. Uh, you have to have a whole series of different conventions and methodologies in order to put this in place. Uh, conceptually, all of the calculations that go into this are much more complex. Um, the, other, the other issue is the methodology that ISDA will be using with a backward looking observation shift uh, doesn't work terribly well for loans where principal can fluctuate over time. So compounded in arrears, um, economically correct, very difficult to operationalize. Um, the, other, the other thing that I'd mentioned about compounded in arrears is that even within compounded in arrears, there's various different, um, call them sub flavors as well. Uh, you could have a compound the balance approach, which is just multiplying your interest by the outstanding uh, principal and accrued interest on any, any given day. Sounds simple, but the vendors aren't, uh, most of the vendors aren't going to be supporting that. Uh, the other sub flavor is called compound the rate. And if you've seen um, one of the concept credit agreements that we put out with the LSTA, this includes that big formula that gets you to a rate at the end of the period. Um, it works, but it is, is complex. And even within that, there's a couple of different sub flavors as well. So compounded in arrears um, is one that many market participants may try to go to and may end up going to, but it is, is complex. It, it seems like there's still a fair amount of uncertainty and we probably need to get to some market consensus on these things pretty soon for banks to be able to get their systems in place to do pilot programs. How, how far away do you feel like we are from some consensus on what's going to be the actual rate used in the loan market? Yeah, so the, the um, you know, part, part of the issue with the LIBOR transition, unlike many regulatory, um, regulatory requirements that come down over the years, is there is no one telling the market, this is what you are going to do. It's up to the market to determine, each, and each individual institution to, in, to determine what is best for their institution. And because of that, as I mentioned, none of these rates are perfect. You know, maybe aside from term sulfur, which probably would be the standard if it were here, um, there's, there's pluses and minuses to all of these rates, um, including importantly that um, all of these rates are likely to have some basis between them and standard is to swaps. So because of that, unfortunately, um, I think that the market is not going to coalesce around one firm answer. Uh, there may be different firms doing different things. Some may go to a simple sofa. Some may try to do a compounded in arrears. Some may try to do a daily simple sofa for a period until term sofa exists and then flip into it. So I think the next, uh, you know, the next year or two, despite the best efforts of everyone to get some market consensus, is there likely is going to be uh, some divergence in, in market practice that we'll see, um, at least until a term so far um, exists on the scene, in which case uh, we may, the market may gravitate naturally towards the term so far. Any other considerations that folks should think about using when using so far as their benchmark rate? Yeah. Um, yeah. As, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the one of the key things with SOFR when you're doing a fallback from LIBOR is it is fundamentally a different rate than LIBOR. Uh, therefore, there is being developed something called a spread adjustment uh, to attach to the end of SOFR, um, and it may be a positive number, maybe a negative number. Um, it will be something when added to SOFR will make SOFR more comparable to LIBOR. Not the same, you can never get to the same, but you can try to make that more comparable. Um, good news is there's, there's basically market consensus now on how to do this spread adjustment. It will be using a five-year historical median between LIBOR and SOFR so that some of the spikiness is, is smoothed out. Um, there's also good news in that uh, ISDA and ARC are both going to be using the same methodology. Um, so once this is determined, the spread adjustment across the market when you're going from, say, a one-month LIBOR to a one-month SOFR should be the same. 
um, and then three month to three month. Um, and that number will be static as well. So it's not a floating number, it's a, it's a static number. Uh, but that's gonna be a very important part of the LIBOR transition is, is developing that spread adjustment. Um, a couple of other things, um, floors are very important. Um, uh, most, uh, many institutions are using floors for LIBOR now, we'll probably be using them for SOFR in the future, uh, but there is some complexity in how those floors um, into SOFR depending upon which flavor you use. Uh, they're likely going to be on a daily basis as opposed to a period basis uh, because funds need to strike their NAV on a daily basis. Banks' internal systems need to keep track of interest on a daily basis and um, uh, trading has to happen on a daily basis. So those floors, even for a compound in the rears, will be likely be a daily floor. Um, a couple of other minor things or things that may seem minor but are actually important. Um, one is uh, so for business days. Um, you may have been become used to using a London business day for your um, for your interest rate determinations. Um, with, with apologies to uh, my friends from across the pond, um, we're not going to need you anymore <laughs> for doing our rates here in the U.S. Uh, so the business day convention will be uh, basically a New York a SIFMA. Uh, securities industry business day. Um, and then the last thing sounds a little bit wonky, but is actually uh, pretty important, um, rounding. Um, for a uh, compounded in arrears, the market coming up with a standard uh, consistent rounding basis is actually pretty important. Uh, if you're doing this calculation on a daily basis, whether you're rounding to five decimals or eight decimals, um, it may not matter more than a penny or two during a month, but if you have an agent system that is sending out a bunch of numbers to the syndicate and a bunch of syndicate computers are rejecting those numbers because they're off by a penny, uh, that will cause a, a good deal of operational headache. So coming up with, with things as minor as figuring out uh, rounding uh, is going to matter. Uh, let's go back to that jurisdictional point for one second. I mean, one of the nice things about LIBOR was it was applicable across, you know, five of the predominant currencies in the U.S. syndicated loan markets and, and for us in Fund Finance as well. But, but so far is U.S. dollar centric. How, how is that all going to work? Yeah, so, so LIBOR is going to be going, across, uh, going away uh, across a number of different jurisdictions. And the process for that is each jurisdiction got together in its own way uh, and tried to figure out what would be the recommended replacement rate. And as you can imagine, different jurisdictions made different selections in how to get there. Some rates will be secured, some will be unsecured, there'll be other differences between the rates. So the, the issue for particularly for multi-currency facilities is that with LIBOR, philosophically, the building blocks for the rate were the same across all the different jurisdictions. It was just some were priced in dollars, some price in yen, and some were priced in Swiss francs. Now, because the underlining fundamentals of the rates are going to be different, um, you may very well need a different margin for different currencies. You can't, you likely cannot just apply the same margin across a variety of different currencies and get the same return uh, for the bank. Uh, so there's going to be more complexity, definitely more complexity in pricing and, and documentation going forward uh, due to the di divergence in different jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. And when you talked about vendors before, were you talking about like IT systems providers to the banks? Yes. Yeah. The, 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 the systems providers who have been kind of in, in enormously a uh, key part of this throughout the, the entire process, um, both making sure that they were operationally ready, uh, getting their input on what they can do and what they can't do uh, as the rates get built. Um, having those having those systems providers ready to go for LIBOR transition is important, um, and it's also important to have consistency amongst vendors so that 
when people are, say, using a compounded in advance SOFR, uh, the different vendors are treating that the same way and feeding the same numbers into, into bank systems. Yeah. Now, I was just thinking about, you know, the administrative agent responsibilities for making these adjustments through their systems and getting it done accurately across a variety of currencies is pretty meaningful uh, amount of work. And folks probably need to be getting on that sooner rather than later, I would think. Uh, yeah. And ho hopefully, hopefully those of you that are that are listening to this um, um, have been uh, undertaking this process for quite some time now. Uh, but Apart from the, the legal documentation, uh, potential uh, legal risks associated with transition, um, the, the tech side of this, the operation side, is, is a pretty large lift. And most financial institutions are, are spending a, a, a fair deal of time and money over the last year, year and a half, making sure that their systems are, are going to be up to snuff when LIBOR goes away. That's great, Jeff. Well, you know, really, really appreciate all the work you're doing, supporting our team on LIBOR transition, supporting a number of our clients on their LIBOR transition and their uh, decisioning as to so for thanks. Thanks also for making time to chat with us a little bit today. Thanks for having me back and um, good luck to everyone on their LIBOR transition. So next we have with us Mac McDonald, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Renaissance West Community Initiative, a really innovative nonprofit that holistically attacks poverty uh, and, and really aligns with what we're trying to be at Cadwallader in terms of uh, you know, bringing community give back to being a core part of who we are. Mac, how you doing? Thanks for joining us. I'm doing great. Hope you're well. Yeah, doing, doing real well. You're in Charlotte with me. It's good to have another Charlotte person on. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Well, tell us a little bit about Renaissance West and your mission. So, yeah, um, thank you for that. Renaissance West um, is, uh, our, our mission is to help people break cycles of generational poverty. And we do that with a holistic community-based approach, where instead of providing services to an entire region, we focus on eliminating poverty one neighborhood at a time. So we do that by going into a, a previously distressed neighborhood and we'll rebuild that neighborhood in whatever ways that need to be done. Uh, in this particular uh, situation, we're part of what is called Purpose Built Communities Network. And they have an approach that's based on three pillars. Uh, one pillar is safe, affordable, quality housing. The second pillar is cradle to career education pipeline. And then the the third is to build a thriving community through initiatives around health, wellness, and opportunity. And so we're out in uh, a neighborhood that was a formerly um, a failed housing project and brought in new housing and then brought in our own schools and the services uh, that are needed to support families on their journey out of poverty. Yeah, well, that, that, that's terrific. What are some of the key programs that you guys are working on right now? Yeah, so when you look at um, those three pillars that I talked about with the housing, with the education, and then with the wraparound services, um, we built our own child development center on site. And, uh, and it's operated though by our local YMCA. So when we look at education and the impact that it has on poverty, it's really critical. And so our education pipeline consists of the Howard Levine Child Development Center. And then we uh, partnered with our local school system and built a pre-K to eighth grade school on campus. And then we work with our local high school as well as community college and some of our other educational institutions to bring skills building and training for our adults. So we have our own adult literacy class or um, uh, high school equivalency, which used to be called GED. We bring that on site. We bring financial literacy courses on site. We bring parenting. We bring just really anything that a, a family would need to um, be successful on that upward mobility journey. We also have a program, uh, care coordinators and life navigators that really they function as coaches for families. 
And so a lot of families coming out of generational poverty don't have a history means or even understanding of what it takes to get out and stay out of poverty. So we have this program that provides coaches for those families to help them do goal setting, but then also to help coach them through the process of goal attainment. Uh, and then the rest of it, as far as building a thriving community, uh, it's really all the, the, the types of programs that any of us would need to have a strong family. So again, I had mentioned uh, uh, parenting classes, financial literacy, um, just any types of career attainment. We also work with local partners, some of our uh, corporate partners that do job fairs there. Uh, they'll do um, um, internships and apprenticeships. And, um, and then we work with our he healthcare systems that have provided uh, on-site nurses to, to uh, work with some of our clients around uh, issues of health and healthy living. And so it's really a one-stop type of shop. We're called a community quarterback. Uh, and, and it's just that we coordinate the other players, quote, so to speak, in the neighborhood to help our families with the, um, the poverty journey. Uh, approximately how many families are in this, this particular program? So um, the neighborhoods that we've adopted, which are two adjacent neighborhoods, when we combine those neighborhoods, there's approximately 1,300 people. So wow. around, six, around 600 families. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. But it's, it's just terrific work that y'all are doing. I assume that both COVID and then the, the social justices challenges that have, that have been going on this summer have really impacted the need of, of your families. How, how, how have you guys been, been dealing with the increases in the needs these, this summer? Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, just for, you know, like for all of us, right? The, when, when the pandemic hit, uh, it was extremely disruptive. If you can imagine being in a fragile community already, and I, I don't know about you, but for, for me, it was, you know, like the scramble, right? To get your toilet paper, get your food, to, to, to make sure that you can continue to support your, your family. And imagine if you're in a family that doesn't have the social capital that we might have, right? And so the first, thing that happened was there was a lot of fear and panic in the community. But the good thing about our role as community quarterback, we were already in the community. And so they had a source, a resource that they could come to. And really the first thing that we had to do was help deal with the fear. And then once we helped our families understand that things are going to be okay, we're here to, to, to help work things out. Then we focus on the same things that you and I might have focused on, getting the basic needs met. So we had to pivot from, you know, the, the, the skills building and, and uh, um, the empowerment part to just the basic stability of, of families. And, you know, so we, we made sure that they had food. We made sure they had the toiletries and the hygiene products that they need, that all of us needed at that time. Once that calmed down, then we started to pivot back to, okay, what are your goals and, and how in this new environment can we continue to help you with your goals? So we had about 25% of our neighbors that either that, that lost jobs or income. And so for those neighbors, we helped them navigate through the new COVID relief funds and what they qualified for and didn't qualify for. And then, you know, one of the things that came out of the pandemic was new jobs were created. So I think was it the um, distribution and logistics started to boom. And so we were able to help some of our neighbors pivot from what they were doing before over to these new logistics jobs. Um, now, you know, one of the things that we're focused on is around the country, a lot of school systems are trying to determine how to deliver education. And so if you could imagine in a high poverty neighborhood, folks don't have the same connectivity to the technology that we might have, right? So they call that the digital divide. So we've been working with the schools and some of our partners to help figure out, one, how do we help our neighbors have the connectivity that they need to educate their children? But then two, uh, a lot of parents just, you know, don't have the, 
type of skills to help their child through these online systems. And so we're still working those out, but, but the, 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 the pandemic has had a great impact, but like the rest of our country, we're, we're pivoting around that and coming up with some solutions for our family. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Well, you know, if someone uh, finds your mission, uh, you know, aligned with their charitable interests, you know, how can somebody get involved and what could they do to contribute? Yeah, so right now, you know, we have our own website, www.rwci.org. And I was like, like most good nonprofits, we have a donate now button. You can also reach out to me. My contact information is there as you would imagine, uh, funding to continue our role as a community quarterback. We see what we do, especially here in the Charlotte region, as something that's unique, that can, will have a great impact on helping families for years to come break out of poverty. So funding for our role as community quarterback is the number one thing for us. If the pandemic wasn't in effect the way that it is, we'd say also a close second to that is volunteering. We have limited volunteering opportunities. Um, and then just reach out to us. If, if you're in the Charlotte region, we do have some opportunities to support our school. Uh, we're, we're still trying to provide certain resources for our students. Uh, we're still trying to figure out a way that if someone's interested in mentoring, families through the technology, a digital divide, that would be great. Um, and then uh, we do from time to time have um, basic needs, drives, toiletries primarily, cleaning supplies, but really the greatest impact probably for the next six months to a year would be just helping to fund us so we, that we can continue our work. And just to share that, the most critical component of our work during this time has been that group of people called uh, life navigators and care coordinators. So if we can continue that work throughout this time and the demand for those types of folks has actually increased. So any financial support would be great to help us continue that and to provide the services to the residents in our neighborhood. Bet. You bet. Well, look, it's terrific work you guys are doing, Mac. You can count on me for a contribution this summer. Uh, thank you very much for joining and telling us a little bit about Renaissance West. Well, thanks to you and, and just thanks to everyone out and, and that's listening to this and, and, and hearing about Renaissance West Community Initiative. We really appreciate this time that you're spending with us. You bet. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this week's edition of Fund Finance Friday Industry Conversations. If you have any suggestions for how we can make it more productive, please reach out. Have a great weekend. The material and information contained in the podcast is for general informational purposes only. Any use of the audio within this podcast without the express consent of Cadwallader is prohibited. Quotes from this podcast may not be used without the express permission of the speaker.